Well, this is the time for the children's group to go out. If you guys want to make your way, you've been so good. That was an extra like 15 minutes for them in the room. I'm really impressed with how they did. Can we just extend a hand towards them? Guys, you know our value. We're not kicking them out. We're sending them out. They are learning to be the next generation of leaders and prophets and evangelists and apostles and all the teachers and all the other stuff. They are going to learn what it means to walk in their identity. So, Father, we bless them as they are taught the word of God this morning. Amen. Amen. Oh, and I pray that for us too. You know, that in this room, and I mean this sincerely, it doesn't matter your age, you are being trained right now by God to be the best version of yourself, to, to actually really know how to fully walk in everything God has for you. I'm in that place. It doesn't matter that I have the title of pastor. I am in training. I am learning. I am growing. I am being developed. And I have to be hungry for more of that. And I got really challenged um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, actually, by Dell, he's in the room. I'm going to talk about you, Dell. You ready? It's a good thing. So I was really blessed and challenged by a blessing that Dell did to me. Dell said to me, we're in a Sunday operations meeting. It's a meeting we have on Mondays with the different churches to come together. We just talk about what God is doing in our churches and how we can seek his face better. And we're in a conversation, and Dell just was so kind and just said something. He said to me, I'm really inspired by you and your desire to go after supernatural. Ah, it just blessed me. It really blessed me. But it also really challenged me because I sat back and I just, and it just stayed in the back of my head and I went, oh, I could be doing more of that though. Oh, I, actually, am I taking time to be intentional on that on a Sunday morning? I've got my message ready. I believe in the equipping of the word. And through, but am I taking time to go, and God, if you really want to mess it all up because you want me to say something that you're saying, am I ready for that? And in principle, I'd say yes, but I realized I wasn't putting it in practice. I just got challenged by that. I want to encourage you, first of all, just because you receive a blessing, first of all, don't push it aside. Receive it. Yeah. I didn't say to him, oh, it's all Jesus. No, it's not that good. Okay. Oh, I just, this is a side, but you need to get this. Actually, this is a massive aside. We have this thing in Christian circles that I think it, it comes from the right heart, but it's misplaced. If I come to you, let's say someone leads worship, I go, hey, that was an amazing time of worship. And your answer is, it's all Jesus. It's, it wasn't that good. Okay? Like, look, during that, it's a joke, but I'm like, it's, it wasn't that good. Learn to receive encouragement. Learn to receive compliments. Yes, we all agree. It's all about him. Every good thing we have, every good gift... But if someone says, John, that message was amazing, I don't go, oh, it was all Jesus. I'm like, compare me to what Jesus preached? No, we're not on the same page here. I'm still developing. What you're doing is going, thank you, I received that, and it should inspire me to go further. Does that make sense? So Dell encouraged me, he blessed me, he shared a compliment to me, and it did something in my spirit that went, oh, I need to step further into this. Oh, I might preach a whole other message right now. Anyway, I'm going to get stuck in there. Let me just say why I'm saying this. Because I was in worship, and I just paused, and I, it just came to my head. And I was like, God, what are you doing in the room? So before I go into my message, I just want to share this. Two words that God shared. First of all, I, I felt back pain, and it's not mine. And I just want to ask, who in this room has back pain? Especially lower back, and it's like muscle spasms in particular. Yeah? There's a few. Can you just be courageous? Put a hand up, because God wants to touch you right now. There's at least one. If you're watching online, just leave a comment. <clears throat> we will want to pray for you and, and pray for that. So, all right, we've got one hand. Is there anyone else who has back pain right now? Any issues? Hips? If you want some healing, if you've got pain and you want some healing and it's in that area, okay, wonderful. Guys, can you be courageous and just stand up for a second? We, guys, the church, you are the ministry team. You know this. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So can you just ask them if they're comfortable with it? And just ask them where the pain is. We're just going to do this for 30 seconds. It doesn't need to be longer. So make sure everyone's got someone with them. This is your moment. Yep, it's all right. You can get out of your chairs on a Sunday morning. You're allowed. Go and find someone. Make sure they're not alone. Perfect. Just ask them where the pain is, what it is. Okay. When they've told you, just declare the goodness of God. Declare healing in their bodies right now. You're not begging for God to move. You're declaring his power. Thank you, Jesus. Declare the healing of God right now. 
Wonderful. Just 10 more seconds. Just declare the power of God. All right, pause. Ask them to t- try it out. Guys, we're doing practicals here. Ask them to try it out. Tell, ask them. And guys, if you're the ones, test out. If you can test it out, let them know if the pain's the same or if it's changed. We just had a pain gone. Praise the Lord. What, t- Rob, tell me what happened. You're in pain and it's just completely gone. Yeah, and completely gone. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a clap. Come on, guys. Like, that's amazing. Praise Jesus. What about you two? Any, any shift? It's okay? Not yet. Okay, we're going to pray one more time. John? Not that yet. Okay, one more. Guys, 10 seconds. Just declare. the. Pro- I'm just declaring right now healing in the name of Jesus. It says in his word, by his stripes, we were healed. We don't have to beg for this. This is our inheritance in Jesus I just declare your healing in the name of Jesus. Declare your healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the healing that's already taken place. All right, guys, just test it out if you're able to right now, real quick, and believe in expecting. All right, wonderful. Well, for you guys who are still expecting your healing, um, throughout the message, I mean this sincerely, just be expecting God's going to move. Let's just be expecting for God to actually do what his word says he does. Amen? All right, you can take a seat. It's not a normal Sunday. It's weird to do this one in the preach time. This is fine. I'm okay with this. Absolutely. The second one I had is this. I saw this picture, and I believe there's a couple of people in the room for this. And the image I had was you're trying to move forward. And I don't know specifically if it was in a relationship or your walk with God, or, but what was happening is it felt like you had a harness and there was a, a cord pulling you back. And it was like resistance. And you're trying to move forward, but you just feel... You're being held back. You're being pulled back. And I just want to ask, is there people in the room right now that just resonates straight away for you? Thank you. Is there anyone else? You're just like, yeah, I just feel wonderful. Anyone else in the room? Okay. Look, I'm not asking you to stand or get prayer. I just want to release the word that was given. And actually, even if you, maybe you're like, no, no, exactly. This is the word that God said to me. What I saw was, as, as you came before him, you were trying to run forward and there just felt this pull. But what you did was you stopped and you put your hands up and you position yourself in surrender. Instead of trying to do it by your own stride, you just stopped and you surrendered. And what happened was this harness turned around and came to the front and suddenly you're getting pulled forward and Jesus took the took it in its place. Instead of being pulled back, the harness turned in front, and actually suddenly you're being pulled into a next generation, uh, next gener- into the next season. I just want to declare for you two and anyone else in the room, and if you're watching online, that there is an acceleration of blessing happening in your lives right now. There is an acceleration, but it requires surrender. It requires to stop trying to do it in your own stride, to surrender to him, to put your hands up and go, God, I can't stop this pull but I know you can turn it around, literally. You can turn this situation around, and God is pulling you into the next place, into the next season. Amen. Bless you guys. Well, should we dive into the Word today? All right. Well, we are excited. There's something in me, and I blame school for this, that thinks that the 1st of September is a new year. That is deeply embedded in my brain, because you go into a new school or you go into a new class, there's something in me that just says, first of September is a new year, right? Aren't we already in 24? Like, that's just how my brain works. Anyway, it works for me for church, though. We're coming out. And so Carla and I have just been praying, God, what is it that you're wanting to do? What is, you know, we could come up with our whole list of subjects that we want to preach or talk about. But God, what are you doing? And Carla and I have kind of digested this over the month of August. And we have actually got a, a slide. Thank you, Tom. Um, if you can't see it very well, it will start going up on our Facebook and things like that, so you'll see this. We're going to have this up all the time. This is what God gave us. I-P-H. Intimacy, passion, and hunger. The call to discipleship. We are going to take the next three months to talk about one subject, and it's discipleship. We're unapologetic about it. I'm going to be very clear to you all right now in the room and watching online. This church is a discipleship church. We're not here to fill seats. We're not here for, for how many numbers we can get in. 
We're not here for any of that. We're here to create disciples of Jesus Christ, to be and create disciples of Jesus Christ. And a disciple has three traits. And, we'll dis- and we're going to look through this through the next three months. There are three traits that are always there for a true disciple. They're intimate with God. They're intimate with the Holy Spirit. They're passionate about the Word. They're passionate about the lost. They're passionate in worship. They're passionate for God. And they're hungry for more. And they live surrendered. So we're going to keep this up. And basically, you're going to see this symbol a lot. And I want us to just have this in our brain. Just deeply embedded in us. Am I, li- am I living IPH? Am I living in intimacy? Am I living passionately? And am I, am I hungry for more of him? And we're going to take our time with this. So I'm going to launch the subject this morning with... Um, my message title for you in this is The Mark of a True Disciple. And we're going to look at what Jesus said. I know, sometimes we look at it. But we're going to actually look at what Jesus himself said about discipleship. And um, I've wrote, I wrote, ri- I wrote, that's the correct word, um, a little summary of what I believe a disciple is. A disciple is someone who is abandoned and surrendered to Christ, who has an undivided heart that is wholly dedicated to loving and following the Lord. That is my definition that I see in the word of a disciple. I'm going to read it again. A disciple, that should be me and you. We're not followers in this room. We're kingdom builders. A disciple is someone who is abandoned and surrendered to Christ who has an undivided heart that is wholly dedicated to loving and following the Lord. Amen? See, in order to be a true disciple, there's a price to pay. We, we have somehow for, walked away in the church with Big C of the calling to discipleship, to be and create disciples. We want people to come to church. We want people to know that they're loved. These are important things. We want people to to have fun in church. We want people to have a good time. We want people to know that, you know, God is for them. These are all really important things. But we don't always want to tell them what Jesus actually said about following him. That it actually costs everything. It costs everything everything. And I want you to turn, if you've got your Bibles, and I know you're a Bible church, come on. Luke 14, we'll start in verse 25. Luke 14, verse 25. So I'll just be of context. This is Jesus, and he's with his disciples, but he's also with a large crowd. If you look at some of the chapters before, we can estimate there's at least 15,000 people following him at this point between men, women, and children. About 15,000 people are around. And, you know, they're around because Jesus is the place to be. They're walking with Jesus, and they're seeing miracles. They're seeing the dead raised. They're seeing healings. They're being encouraged. They're seeing deliverances. They're seeing everything. Like, it is the place to be. Like, follow this guy. He is the, he's got the blue tick. You know what I mean? On Instagram. He, like, let's get to know who this guy is. I want to see every content he has. He's come out with a new fish and water bottle thing. Like, come on, let's get some of that. They're following him. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, they're just, they're following. They're interested. They're intrigued. They want to see what's happening. And we come to this passage And we're going to read it, but Jesus turns to them. That's an important word. He turns to them. And he delivers this message because basically Jesus says to them, look, do you want to just follow or do you want to be a disciple? Because it's not the same thing. Do you want to follow me or be my disciple? Because it's not the same thing. So let's look at it. Verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brother and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot 
be my disciple. Not he's not doing a good job at being my disciple. Not he's going to struggle to be my disciple. Not he's not fully got there. No, he cannot be my disciple. Let's stop there for a second. Okay, it's important. We've talked about this before. You cannot take one verse out of context and create a theology around it. Is Jesus really teaching, doing a hate speech right now? Is Jesus, can we look at this and go, see, Jesus was a hater. Gee, I knew it. Jesus hated everyone. No. what? Because you have to look at the other teachings of Jesus. You have to look at the word in its entirety. So we know that Jesus is not teaching us to hate Jesus tells us to love. He's not asking you to hate your brother and your mother and father. He told you to honor your mother and father. Jesus told you to, he said, here, hate your wife. Wait a minute. Jesus, you also taught us to die for them and to love them and to value them. So what is Jesus actually saying right now? God is seeking whole hearts, not slivers and pieces. God doesn't just want a portion of your heart. He wants all of it. Jesus is giving this extreme contrast between loving him and loving what you see in the world. He, he's saying very simply, your love for me should be so extreme, so set apart, that your love for others, because he's not telling you to hate them really, your love for others should look like hate. Your love for me, your dedication to me, your pursuit of me, your passion of me should literally be so different that when others see you loving others, it looks like hate in comparison. It's a radical kind of love that Jesus doesn't want. He requires to be a disciple. He's showing a contrast. See, the greatest commandment is in Deuteronomy 6, and then Jesus um, says it in Matthew 6. Yes, it is. uh, No, sorry, Matthew 22. Deuteronomy 6, and then Matthew 22. um, The teachers of the law are asking him, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. We've heard that a million times, right? Okay. Do you see how these two come together? If I love the Lord my God with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind, that is literally everything that I am. I don't have extra love to give to things that are not Him. See, I've heard this... mm, I've heard it misplaced sometimes where people say, oh, I love God first and then I love my family and then I love this and I love this. And I understand the principle and it's right. Problem is Jesus shouldn't be even in the same category list. Really? I love Jesus. And out of that love for Jesus flows my love for my family. Out of my love for Jesus flows my love for my family neighbors, for my brother and sister, for my own self, because Jesus did tell us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So Jesus telling you to hate you. No, he never said that. He actually said you should be in love with you. Out of love for me. You love me so much that you start to love my creation. Oh, look at you. You're my creation. My love for you is so set apart, God, that it actually is the container from which all other love flows. The tricky part is, a lot of us go, I love God, but I love my family too. And, and we start doing this, compa- and we add them into a list. The problem is, you, when you get it out of order, you start to fall into the trap of fearing man over God. And wanting to please man over God. And I'm more interested, well, I just don't want my friends, you know, they're not Christian. I don't want them to feel unloved, so I'm not going to go to church and love God, or I'm not going to, you know, do this, or I'm going to spend less time in prayer, I'm going to spend less time in the Word because they don't like it. So out of my love for them, and I have this conversation, out of my love for them, I'm pulling back. That's not love. That's not discipleship. 
out of my love for the Word of God, out of my love for my intimacy with Him, I can love you my best. But if we get it out of order, we end up in fear of man over fear of God, out of pursuit of Him. When our heart's gaze is set on the wrong thing, it contaminates our motives. What is your heart gazed upon? What is your priority? What is the pursuit of your heart? Because if it's Jesus, then everything else is set in place. But if it's what you have, and look, please, you understand I am not telling you to not love your family, but I'm actually saying the words of Jesus. Your love for your family should look like hate compared to your pursuit of God. Now, your family shouldn't feel hated. <laughs> you, you, don't, don't misplace this. Don't twist this. But my love for my family, and I love my family, it has to flow from my love for God. It has to flow from my disciple nature of following Him above all else. Verse 27. Carries, he carries on. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me, again, cannot be my disciple. Okay, what is the cross? Oh my gosh, I've heard so many different versions of this, and I've heard this so misplaced. First of all, it's not the thing around your neck or the tattoo you have on you, okay? He, you have to think about who he's talking to right now. Now, we as Christians, we see the cross as the symbol of victory, and atonement, we're like, we see the cross and we go, yes. They see the cross and go, that's the most painful way to die possible. That's the most shameful way to die possible. That is something that's been brought over by the Roman Empire who's oppressing us to kill the worst of the worst. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. They didn't have a concept. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus is saying to them, if you're not willing to pick up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Try and put your mind in a place. That is, God, Jesus is saying to them, to this large crowd, are you willing to die for me? Are you willing to suffer humiliation for me? Are you willing to be beaten for me? Because these guys, they knew what the cross looked like. They knew what it was. We don't have a good concept of the time. But put yourself when Jesus was speaking. You knew that you were going to get beaten, nailed, potentially, shamed, spit on, ex death exposed. It was horrendous. It was reserved for the worst of the worst. And Jesus turns to the crowd and says, hate everyone, even yourself, or you can't be my disciple, and be willing to die and suffer humiliation and shame, or you can't be my disciple. It's radical. Oh my gosh, we have dumbed down being a disciple in the Western church so much. We say, be a disciple, come to a course. No, no one else heard that? I've heard that before. Be a disciple, sign up to serve in your church. Great things, but that is not the mark of discipleship. Jesus says, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. We need, what is he saying? Are you willing to pay the price, even if it means death? Are you willing to be humiliated? Are you willing to be embarrassed? The shame, are you willing to carry it all? Are you willing to die for me? It's a call to sacrifice. I'm not trying to make this light because this isn't a light thing. And it's important that we know this. The calling to discipleship is not something to just enter lightly. And we'll look at this right now because he carries on. Verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, 
This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way away, a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, verse 33, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. This is intense, Jesus. We love to make Jesus, which he is, loving, graceful, peaceful. Oh, but Jesus has got the children on his knees. Jesus is being so kind to those who aren't being kind. Jesus is stopping people from throwing stones. All very true. And I love that that is our king. But Jesus is also saying, if you want to follow me, you need to die. If you want to follow me, take this seriously. Count the cost. I think this is one aspect that a lot of, not all, because I've heard some and I do appreciate them, but a lot of, you know, we do these big crusades or events or we have like special Sundays where we're really trying to reach the lost, which is wonderful. And we kind of give them this invitation like they can just sign up to a new group. Why don't you just sign up to the heaven group? Huh? Come on, what have you got to lose? You've got nothing to lose. I've literally heard that said before. You've got nothing to lose. Sign up to being a follower of Jesus. And internally, I'm like, oh, they're in for a shock. <laughs> they're in for a massive shock. Because actually, the day they turn, open their, they turn open their Bible and they start reading the words of Jesus, the one they're supposed to be following, and he says, count the cost or don't do it. It's a bit different, right? But this is the reality. And I need, you, I, I'm, I need to be very unapologetic about this. If we are to be a discipleship church, which we're called to be, we cannot do it halfway. You cannot do it with one foot still in the world, one foot in the Jesus camp. You can't, Jesus used so many stories and examples here to get one point across. Are you willing to die for me? And do you understand what it means to be my disciple? If you do not, if you're not willing to give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. Not, again, not, if you're not willing to give up everything, you won't be a very good one. Or you won't be a very effective one. Or you're only a part-time disciple. No, it's all in or all out. You cannot be my disciple. This is intense Jesus. What is he saying? Finish the race. If you say yes to me, finish the race. Count the cost. Don't start building your life around me and then realize you can't get, make it all the way. If you fall down, get back up. Don't stay down. Well, I tried Christianity. It wasn't for me. No, you never tried it then. Look, that, uh, it's brutal, but please understand, these aren't just my opinions. These are the words of Jesus. You didn't try Christianity, and it wasn't for you. You never understood what it was about then. And that's, uh, that's our fault as the church, all right? We have to be the ones. You have to be the ones. When you're sharing the love of God with people, which please, that is, your pl that is what you're called to do, to minister to those around you. Don't invite someone in without letting them know this is going to cost them everything. You don't get to just try Christianity. It's not a group. It's a lifestyle. Once a disciple, always a disciple. That is the calling. So Jesus says, okay, so we say to Jesus, so the crowd's there, okay, so what's the cost exactly following you? Everything. 
literally everything. And maybe even death. Are you okay with that? Well, you, some of you have the faces that the, the followers had. Because Jesus was okay losing the crowds. He was absolutely fine with that. It happens time and time again. But I need us to understand, because we're going to go over this for the next three months. Are we really aware of the cost to call ourselves disciples? I, I want us to be specific with our language. We're not called to just be followers of Jesus. We're called to be his disciples. Jesus sent us out to go and make disciples of all nations, not followers, not groupies of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. And what does it mean to be a disciple? I'm willing, my love for him is so set apart that everything else looks like hate. I count the cost. I'm willing to pick up my cross. I'm willing to be humiliated. I'm willing to take flack. I'm willing to go through hardship. I'm willing to even die for him. That's what it actually means to be a disciple. Are we really aware of the cost? Are we willing to give him our full yes? Because if we do, when we say yes, and all of you in this room, I know you've said yes to this. I'm preaching to the crowd. I get that. But sometimes we need a reminder because Jesus says, okay, then I need your time, your energy, your focus, your finance, your projects, your agenda, your fears, your politics, your relationships, your comfort, your convenience, the list goes on. I need everything. Are you willing to give it all up? Well, uh, you know, I'll give you this, but I'm going to hold this one back. See, I, God, I, I'm, I'm all in on a Sunday morning as long as it's 10.30 to 12.30. If it goes 12.45, I, I turn off. It's a joke. Okay, I'm just seeing if you're awake. You know, I, I'm willing, I'm, I'm all in when I'm signed up to the Bible study. But, you know, uh, I want to know more about you, God. But Wednesdays just don't work for me. And look, I... Please understand, I'm not saying you should be at absolutely everything. You understand that's not my position. What I'm saying is, if, you, if someone came and said, oh, I wish that the church would better equip, I'm like, we have prayer night every Monday night. We have home groups where you get discipled and you work together. Tuesdays, Thursdays. We have community hub where we do life together. We're going to have our youth launching soon where you could serve. We have our evangelism days. We have Bible study. If you want equipping, there's equipping. The issue is us. Because there's another thing you can do. Everything's on YouTube. You could literally listen to preachers nonstop for the rest of your life. There is enough material on YouTube. Promise you. There are enough studies out there. There is so much. The question is, are we actually hungry for it? The question is, are we actually really meaning it when we say yes? See, we have this phrase, and I even say it sometimes, and it's not necessarily wrong, but it can lead you down a misconception, which is, God, I give you my all, right? We sing that a lot. We say it a lot. God, I give this to you. That actually should have already taken place at the beginning when you said yes to being a disciple. All was already his. Does that make sense? Sometimes we say, oh, God, I give you this. I'm like, actually, I should have already given it to you. It was already yours because I gave up everything. Everything is yours. But we live in a society and we've created in some places church with a big C where we can follow Jesus like we follow someone on social media or our favorite author or whatever it is that relevant to you, you know, where we, we kind of check in and out and we follow as long as we like what they're doing. But then, oh, you know, my favorite preacher, he did that preach, and oh, I was a bit intense, so I kind of skipped that one. I skipped that part of the Bible. I don't like how God talks in that part. I don't like what he says there. I don't like that he's calling out my sins. I don't like that he's asking me to actually surrender all. And I'm like, you don't get to follow him like that. You don't get to pick and choose. A disciple is fully abandoned. This is Christianity at its core. He wants everything from us. Absolutely everything. I'm 
So we're looking at time. Bear with me a second. <clears throat> Um, I've had this conversation before. No one in here. You're all great. But someone asked me once, how can Jesus ask for so much? And, and I understood where they're coming from. They, they had lost a lot in their life. They had had difficulties, right? That they had suffered, and I understand that. They were like, how can Jesus ask for so much? And we had a conversation, basically, where I was like, and I said this phrase, whatever price we pay, the reward is so much greater. And I think we lose sight of that sometimes. Whatever price I pay, the reward is so much greater. Jesus is so much greater. Um, I want to tell you a, a quick story. <clears throat> it's a true story. There was a scrap meddler um, in Russia and what he would do, he'd buy items and melt them down and then resell. So he would try and buy gold items in particular so he can melt them down and then resell them, try and make profit off that. And one day he comes across this golden egg. And he, it's a large golden egg. And he knows uh, that if he melts that down, he can make a profit. But the person is asking for $14,000 um, for it. It's not dollars. It's the equivalent of what they have. You understand for the story. Um, they're asking for $14,000, and that's everything he has in a bank. That's everything he has. That's his life savings. And he's like, oh. And he's weighing this thing up where he's like, if I buy this, I'm like 90% sure that I can make a profit. It's worth it for my time and all this kind of stuff because it's quite a long process to melt it down and redo it. So he's going through this whole thing, and he decides to, to look up the egg because there was just a couple of markings on it that just he was confused by. So he looks up this egg, and... Turns out that this is one of 50 golden eggs that were made for the imperial Russian family in the 1900s, worth now $33 million. $33 million. Well, I'm, you can guess the rest of the story, what he does. But I want to point this out. How? I'm going to use the word dumb. Because uh, it really is. How silly. Let's go polite, Christian. How silly of, it of him would it be to buy that egg for 14000 and still melt it down? You'd go, well, that was just silly. You know how valuable this thing is, but because of you've got a plan of what you want to do, you take the most valuable thing and you melt it down back to just what you wanted to do in the first place. Equally, how silly would it be if he spent 14000 he gets this egg and that he knows is now worth $33 million, but he then complains to everyone that he had to spend 14000 Gosh, I got this egg. It's a massive deal, but... Oh my gosh, it was so expensive. It cost me everything, everything I had. You, let me tell you, I had to change these assets. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I want to be really honest. That is most of us as Christians. It really is. We know that by saying yes to Jesus, we have eternity with him. We, be, we get a relationship with the creator of the world. We get filled with the Holy Spirit. We get commission planned, every blessing. We get this incredible lifestyle, but we go, oh, but it cost me everything. Oh, mm, gosh. Let me tell you, oh, you know, I, I had a cushy life before Jesus. And then I get, but we do. Or we get Jesus, but we treat him like we didn't have him. We walk our Christian life like we don't actually have the savior of the world living inside of us. And we operate as if we can carry on living in unrighteousness and think it's okay. When the living God actually chose you to make his dwelling place. But I get to compromise what I look at, what I think on, how I speak. It doesn't matter, it's my life. No, it's not anymore. There's a much higher calling. Well, I want to be Christian, but I want, don't want to change this about my life. Then you don't want to be a Christian. 
Well, I know this is heavy, I, and I'm okay with that today. I don't need you to be smiley. I need, you, I need us to, to have reverence for the reality of discipleship. There are two main reasons that I see, and I want to end with this. There are two main reasons that I see that we struggle with this concept of discipleship the most. There are many more that I could talk to, but I want to talk about these two in particular. First is surrender. We really, especially in the Western church, struggle with surrender. Total surrender. We don't like it. Because most of the world that we live in is actually about us. It's about our convenience, our comfort, our time, our agenda, our plans, our holidays. Our, do you get what I'm saying? Like, my phone didn't upload my, um, I tried to look at something on Google the other day while I was driving, and I'm in the middle of nowhere, and it took maybe 30 seconds, and I got frustrated, and I thought about getting an upgrade. Genuine, real story. And I had this little moment where I went, oh, I've got so, mm, I thought many words. <laughs> that's not okay. But, that's, but this is reality, right? I want it now. Who, so what? I'm in the middle of nowhere and there's no cell tower around. I demand that I can find my way as I want. Like, it's ridiculous. Do you know I was actually just Googling a Tesco because I forgot to buy it? Like, it's nothing important, but because of, and I created this whole thing where I was like, I am the center of the universe in this moment. I am what matters. How dare they not have built a cell tower exactly where I'd be today? But we, we live that way. And we don't understand, actually, discipleship is full surrender. And he loves to bless us. He loves to give us good things. He loves that we love our family. He loves that you have activities that you enjoy. He loves those things. But are they all surrendered to him? Do you live in that place? Turn in your Bibles, Matthew 13, 44. Matthew 13. <clears throat> Matthew 13, verse 44. <clears throat> says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then his joy went, and, and then in his joy, sorry, he went. And sold all that he had and, and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a Martian looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value who went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus is a treasure. Like, do we mean that? Do we believe that deep in our heart? The knowledge of the kingdom of God, the person of Jesus is my treasure. Like, can you say that with a sincere heart? Like, he is worth everything. I would sell everything I had to buy the land because I've discovered the pearl. I would lay everything down because of the person of Jesus in my life. I will go anywhere. I will do anything. I will sacrifice anything for Jesus. I will pick up my cross. That doesn't mean, I've heard this preach, oh, I've got this colleague at work and they're really difficult to work with. It's my cross to bear. No, it's not. Like that, don't, don't say that. That's not the word of God, okay? That's not what we're talking about. Some inconvenience is my cross. No, am I willing to be humiliated? We had a message from Open Doors not long ago. Am I willing to die for the gospel? We're so, it's so peaceful in our world, really. Like, there are some situations, you may have heard about this. This was just a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was a street preacher who was arrested because he refused to stop preaching the word in the street. He was arrested. Two days later, there was a counselor who saw, because it was recorded, he saw the video, and he's a councilman. And he's a Christian. And what happened was this street preacher, you can find it on um, the news, I think it was BBC, um, there was a, a pride march or activity happening. 
And they started mocking the street preacher. And when he got arrested, they started cheering and, and filming it and threw things at him and spat at him. But no one got arrested for that. And this Christian counselor, um, councilman, sorry, just did a post. I think it was on um, Facebook or Twitter of this video and just said, being prideful is a sin. We can't be okay with it. And he just shared just the word of God. No more. It wasn't an attack. He said, this behavior is not something we should be celebrating. He's been fired. Immediately. Hate crime, apparently. Let's be very honest. That's pretty much the worst we experience in this nation. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not saying the church shouldn't be praying for that. And we shouldn't be aware that there is an opposition to the word of God being shared. But we live in a society that really, we're okay. That's pretty much the worst you're going to get. If you're not sure about other places in the world, talk to Bill, read some of the open doors, talk to our missions team. You can die. No jury, just execution because you're holding a Bible. Are we, in our world, this is who I'm talking to, are we willing to pay the price? Count yourself lucky for where we live. Count yourself blessed that the worst you might get is a bit of mockery. But are you willing to pay the price because you're fully surrendered to him? The second one, I'm just going to finish our, our message today with this. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians, please. It's my last time of turning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. It says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on, on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I call it short-term vision. A lot of us live with very short-term vision. If I could just get through this period, if I just get through this, and we live our discipleship life with what we can see right in front of us as the end of that time. Our eyes need to be fixed on Him. Discipleship. Let me read what I put because I want I want to be clear on this. When I say short-term vision, I'm not just talking about the positive. I'm talking about the negative as well. Let me put it this way. Your need to be right doesn't matter in comparison to your calling to live in forgiveness and grace. A disciple understands that. Because you don't even enter into the bitterness and unforgiveness game. Because it's so short-term. It's toxic. It's poison. And it's short-term vision. Well, I'm offended now. This is all I can see. But my calling as a disciple is what Jesus calls me to. Forgiveness, love, grace, mercy. Live above offense. That's what God calls me to. I'm a disciple of him, not a subject to my circumstances. Another one. Your need for an easy life. This is what really gets me. My need for an easy life doesn't matter in comparison to your call to maturity in Christ. Let me be really clear. I was talking with Dell actually about this yesterday, so Dell's getting two loads. Um, we love the principle of I can come on a Sunday and I'll go to whatever activity I want in the week at church and I'm a disciple. It's what happens when no one's looking. It's what you do when you're on your own. It's what you think on. It's what you say out loud. It's what you allow in your heart. It's what you do in that place. It's the heart position you have before God going, Holy Spirit, reveal to me what's not of you. Holy Spirit, bring people into my life. I wonder how many of us pray this. Holy Spirit, bring people into my life who are going to call me out. 
Bring people into my life who are going to call me to a higher standard, who are going to inspire me. Not so I feel shame, but I feel inspired to live. Wow, they're doing this. I need to be walking in that as well. I don't want to run away from those people because I feel bad about myself. No, no, no. I need to be around those people because there's something that they've discovered that I'm not yet living. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what's in your word that I'm not getting. Help me with my addictions. Help me with my gossip. Help me with that slander. Help me with my anxiety. Help me with these things. Are we actually submitted, hungry to be transformed so we can look like him? Is our, or do we live with short-term vision? I, I, I feel my... my <laughs> How many have seen all the memes and stuff of like, all I'm trying to do is to get to Friday, right? And I understand it. A couple of weeks ago, I had that week. It hit Tuesday, and I remember looking at my calendar and go, Tuesday only, oh my gosh. Like that was, it was a hard beginning of a week, and I just had that moment of like, oh, Sunday, be here. Because Sunday is my relaxing time. I love this. Like, that's, it's my best moment. I was like, oh. But we live that way, though, sometimes. I'm happy with who I am, how, as I am, because I get by. You don't call to get by. You want to have an easy life? You can't have a Christian life. Because you're called to discipleship. You're called to maturity. We're all called to mature in Christ. How do we mature in Christ? Through trials. Oh, I, oh we don't like that. <laughs> we don't like that. I'm called to mature in Him. And the only way that I can grow... It's for my character to grow. How does my character grow? Through trials and endurance. But I want an easy Sunday morning Christian life. Okay, then you're a follower, not a disciple. By the words of Jesus, not John Blacker's opinion. This is why the word matters so much. And this is why this series matters. Guys, it's eternity in mind. Live with eternity in mind. Lift your gaze. Focus on the things that matter. I am a work in progress until the day he takes me home. I have to live that way. And that's your calling to you. Luke 14, I really encourage you in your own time this week, read it for yourself. Look at it. It's the call to discipleship. Many left Jesus. I heard someone say it this way, and I think it, it's maybe a bit harsh, but quite funny. Jesus wouldn't get in, invited to any of our church growing conferences we do. And I was like, it's a little harsh, but there's some reality to it, right? What did Jesus do? He said, drink my blood, eat my flesh, and stop. He didn't explain it. <laughs> Thousands left him in that moment, never followed him. Turns to his disciples and says, what about you guys? You want to go too? And I love Peter's response. You may have heard me share this before. I love Peter's response. Where would we go? That, that makes me think he thought about it. <laughs> like that just, that's my opinion, okay? I'm not saying that's word. But I'm like, where would we go? Probably like he went through a list of like, well, who else could we be a disciple of? Like, uh, this one's a bit extreme. He says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. He didn't say, oh, no, we're staying with you because we understand what you meant. No, he didn't know. Disciples had no idea what he was talking about. Like he said, you have the words of eternal life. Where would we go? I'm in all the way. There's no option B. Jesus didn't try and create big crowds. He looked for disciples. We need disciples. We don't need bigger churches. We need disciples. The numbers will come, but they need to come as disciples. Disciples. We need to be reaching the world. We need to be reaching the town. Absolutely. But please understand, Sunday morning, I'm not, we're not ever going to put it on to impress the crowds. We're here to be discipled. So that when we go out, that's when. You're out there. You're reaching people. There's absolutely a time and a place. And this is why we do street violence. There's a time and a place to bring in people for them to discover what Christianity should really look like. But I remember saying this a lot, and some of you may have heard this many times, but I'm like, why would the, for a lot of people, why would the world want to be in church? They, we look the same as them. We're not called to look the same. 
called to be disciples. Can you stand with me? Um, I just want to pray as we end. Uh, Del, Ronnie, are, are, do you have something? If you could just, even just some worship in the background. We're just going to take a moment, just for the last couple of minutes, guys. We'll end in a few minutes. You, <clears throat> and I want us to just honestly take this before the Lord. Um, some of our ministry team are here if you want prayer for anything in particular. But really, I want you to just do this, you and God. Give him a fresh yes. Give him a fresh surrender. Refocus your heart. God, I pray right now for each one of us that there would be a a drive. I'm actually asking Holy Spirit for a drive inside of us that says, I want to be a disciple, not just a follower. I want to be discipled. I want to give up everything for you. Because I know that whatever price I have to pay, the reward is so much greater. You are so much greater than any price I could possibly pay. Anchor that in as God. That we would actually long to be stretched and called to maturity in Christ and discover things in your word. And no longer live with this one for in, one for out. God, that we would be a house of discipleship. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You are called to make disciples. You have to be a disciple first. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus, that the only way we can do this is with your Holy Spirit and you gave him to us. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We surrender it all to you.